Hi, um, good afternoon. We are so happy to have Melissa Moran and Sheree Graham presenting this session called Formative Assessment, Support Growth with a Tech Twist at PSMLA's first ever virtual conference. My name is Jennifer Campbell and I will be hosting today along with Michael Bogdan. The session is being recorded. If you're tweeting or posting on social media, we welcome you to include at PSMLA1 and hashtag PSMLA21 so we can see and you can share all of your thoughts. For attendance purposes, please be sure that your displayed name matches the name used to register for the conference. If you're unsure how to do so, you can send me a message in the chat and I will be happy to provide you with instructions. Please join me in welcoming Melissa Moran and Shrey Graham to PSMLA. Bienvenidos, my name is Melissa Moran and I'm a Spanish educator at Science Leadership Academy at Bieber in the School District of Philadelphia. Bienvenue, my name is Sheree Graham. I'm a French educator at Parkway Center City Middle College in the School District of Philadelphia. Welcome to our session titled Supporting Growth with a Tech Twist. If you have any questions to share during this session, please put it in the chat and make sure to place a question at the beginning so that we know to pause and answer them immediately. During our first section, we're going to talk about formative assessment dues. As we select learning experiences for our classrooms, we have to have a well-rounded approach. Directing our students through the process of gradual release through guiding, practicing, and applying knowledge, personalizing instruction to our students' needs and interests, building community and relationships in our classroom so all learners feel respected and valued, incorporating communicative strategies by facilitating real-time conversations in class, and fostering collaboration to encourage student-to-student -student interaction. And of course, we have to think about ACFL's core practices to guide our instruction as well. They should be at the forefront of our minds as we plan. And in order to facilitate those real-time conversations, we have to make sure the language we're using in class is comprehensible to our students. And planning with a backwards design model, it allows us to know the benchmarks along the way to achieving our learning goals. This assists us as we determine the look force in our formative assessment tasks. So our formative assessment is, uh, formative assessments can take place during the course um, and not explicitly at the end. As we provide students with content and tasks, we need to be sure that directions are clear, the goals are achievable, and that we are providing students timely and relevant feedback. There should be multiple times during the lesson or unit when we are assessing their target goals and current level. All learners are different, and we must remember that we need to try our best to support all of our learners achieve their goals. Keeping rubrics simple, understandable, and providing guidelines for students on where they are, where they can evolve, and the goals to keep in mind are essential. This is an interpersonal rubric that I found online and edited for my students. Two main questions to observe in action. One, comprehensibility. Was I understood? Two, quality of communication. How well did I interact? This idea of red light, yellow light, green light. Red light is the danger zone. Yellow light is gaining and showing development, and green light is success in action. Next, we will transition to the importance of building community and relationships and how it impacts our decision making in our classrooms. We're going to watch a short video about letting students lead with their identity. As we watch, consider how knowing our student population allows us to create more meaningful lessons that allow our students to make connections to the content in their world. Young people's racial and cultural identities are critically important. And we have to acknowledge that the way we have set up opportunities for learning and development are not always respectful of the diversity that we have in this country. As we are thinking about how to maximize chances that young people are thriving, it's important to let them lead 
with their identity. Not bury it, but lead with it. Show it off, be proud of it, actually display it, to perform it, to put it up on the stage, to put it up on the screen, to make videos about it, to write poetry about it. So they are really bringing themselves into the room. If I come into a space and I don't trust this space, and I don't bring my full self into this space, the behavior that you see may not be reflection of my competence, it's a reflection of me not being motivated to show you what I have, because I don't trust this situation. If I don't have a relationship with you, and I don't get to be a little bit more of who I am, you're gonna slow down my learning and development by not knowing me. Schools and community organizations and families and the overall sort of environment of the community are all playing a role in shaping the experiences and contexts and relationships where learning happens. That basically is what the science of learning and development has told us, that all adults, all settings, all experiences matter. Yes! young people. So looking at the cultural iceberg, um, a little history behind it. In 1976, Edward T. Hall, a cultural anthropologist who pioneered the study of nonverbal communication and interactions between members of different ethnic groups, used an iceberg to suggest that culture was similar to an iceberg. He proposed that 10% of the external, which is above the surface, is visible of an iceberg, which is similar to what is visible to the outside world. 90%, which is the majority of the iceberg, which is underwater, represents the depth of the culture and what is hidden. It is easy but unacceptable to make assumptions about a cultural community. So we need to provide students with culturally relevant and accurate depictions in the information we share with students and the tasks we create for them to engage with during the course of the year and beyond using technology, online resources, and incorporating more authentic topics can be an effective way to engage students. Next, we will discuss how we can build confidence and mastery through scaffolding and using routines. As we work within the gradual release model and set learning goals, we must provide scaffolds for our students visuals, modeling, sentence starters, and graphic organizers, when used purposefully, can assist our students as they work towards being independent learners. Here we have some tips for developing routines to promote target language use in the classroom. I'd like to highlight a few of them. Number one, music. Creating playlists of music in the target language on platforms such as Spotify or Apple Music is a great way to expose students to music. Many teachers play songs from March Madness playlists at the beginning of class all throughout the school year. And over the course of the school year, the students are familiar or become familiar with the melody of the song and some of the lyrics of the songs. Um, if we look at number five, it states stress-free forms of communication. Platforms such as Flipgrid and Vocaroo allow students to record themselves speaking for a particular assignment. Um, they can do so at home in a comfortable environment, which is low stakes. So this is um, an example from last year. I tried to infuse a schedule into my virtual classroom last year to provide a way for students to have a simple view of what is expected in class and for assignments. I am currently trying to infuse a similar schedule in my classroom this year um, since we're all back in person. Since the first marking period has always typically, typically been a level one review, I originally created a list of what I would say are important concepts for students to know um, during this review and to learn now, whether they know it or not. 
then I can begin introducing level two content at the beginning of the second marking period. So I'm a big color coded person. So based on color and flow, I just wanted to give students an opportunity to see some kind of pattern uh, with color and with assignments, having a little bit of each thing every week over the course of a month using one content or one concept topic. This is another example of something that I used last year, but I'm also using this year. Um, this is my version of trying to institute a flipped classroom model where students are provided resources and practice assignments to be prepared for in-class review and activities. I'm trying to cut down the time it takes to review content by having students prepare with the basic framework and concept overview prior to me, quote unquote, beginning the lesson. So I'm not trying to have my students come in as empty vessels. I want them to come in and have something to start with so we can cut the instructional time and get to the fun stuff, get to the more engaging items. Um, this was also a routine that worked really well last year uh, virtually, and I have infused it into class using online resources at like Nearpod, but this can also work very well with the standard whiteboard and eraser um, or a pen and paper. Um, you know, Cascada, this idea of a lot of students, some students need more processing time. So having them just engage with the target language. If I'm, you know, saying something about myself in the target language or something that's engaging to them, they have the processing time to do it and then everyone kind of comes together and engages by showing what they understood. So you can do it by whiteboards, you can do it by Nearpod Collaborate board, um, or even something like Padlet. Personalizing instruction and facilitating real-time conversations. So after a discussion in class um, with the framework I use, I typically do a write and discuss. And to the left, we have an infographic from the comprehensible classroom. So what is write and discuss? After co-creating a story or engaging in a discussion with our students, the teacher creates a summary of what was discussed. As the teacher writes, they ask the students questions to help recall information. And these questions serve as another way to expose students to input. And as you're asking the questions and getting feedback from the students, you can assess um, their level of comprehension based on the discussion. As the teacher writes, they enhance the writing by adding transitional phrases and connectors. The teacher pauses to reread what has been written, checking for comprehension. And at this time, the teacher points out a couple of structural features present in the text. Typically, I type the write and discuss passages in a Google Doc and present them on my smart board. To organize them, I typically create a folder, a Google Drive folder for each class. For activities such as special person interviews or calendar talk, I create one document and add to that document day to day. And for co-created stories, I create a new document for each story. Um, many teachers use document cameras and write by hand. Um, I prefer to type them so they're in a digital format right away because I share the Google folders with students on our school's LMS. Um, it's great for when students are absent, they have access to it right away. And if they want to refer to it, um, in the future. Here's an example of what a write and discuss passage looks like for a special person interview. As you see, I highlighted some of the text. Typically, um, as I'm writing, I'll highlight or underline to draw students' attention to various structures. Here's another example of write and discuss, but for weekend chat. And for those who are familiar with French, you'll see or you'll notice that I wanted to draw students' attention to the passé composé. So when we're thinking um, about developing writing skills, we can draw our students' attention to different features for language comparisons, um, but also to things we want to see in their writing. Um, and as an extension, I typically use a quick quiz listening assessment. Um, 
it can either be done on paper, of course, but for Tech Twist, I do them on Google Forms or on Kahoot. And it's pretty simple. You can create a true false listening assessment. The only requirement is that you know which statements need to be true and which ones need to be false ahead of time. Um, as the quiz takes place, the teacher reads the statements from that lessons conversation. Uh, typically, I keep the write and discuss passage on my smart board to support students if they need it, um, but that doesn't have to be the case. The results from these listening assessments inform teachers if the students are comprehending the content of the discussion. Um, it can also be formative assessment for us because maybe we didn't um, provide enough repetition or exposure to the language for the students to be successful with the assessment. So another example of engaging um, and facilitating a conversation is card talk. And virtually last year, I switched it to slide talk. So slide talk, just like card talk, is a zero prep activity. It's student centered because we're talking about student interests and it's an easy extension activity. You can lead to um, a write and discuss or other activities after it. And the student created work can be an individual assignment or done in a small group. So what do you need to do slide talk or cart talk? You need some discussion prompts. So we have some examples here of what do you like? What's your favorite class? Um, questions about food and shopping and locations. And for your tech tool, you need a collaborative workspace. Um, you can use Jamboard or Google Slides, Smart Learning Suite. There are many options available. Here we have an example of a model of a slide talk that I created for my students. So in a Google Slide document with enough slides for all my students, there was one text box for the student's name. And I have my name here, Madam Graham, and I have the activity that I like to do, which is cooking. So besides just um, including one photo of the activity, it's also useful to um, include images of things you need to do that activity, places where you do them, and how that activity um, makes you feel. And it's really useful because you have more visuals on the screen to support the language you're using, which in turn supports comprehension. Foster collaboration among students in real-time feedback on work and progress. We have a short video here about boosting student memory.
Right, so as, as I'm watching um, that video, uh, quite a few things stand out to me. So one of the things that I thought about in terms of whether it be peer-to-peer -peer, um, or review and break um, or practice, 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 uh, one of the things that I enjoy using um, along with um, having students engage with the content, so whether it's daily or weekly activity, teaching culture in the target language, getting to know each other, getting to know me, um, to hopefully build up comprehension and retention um, is either Nearpod and or Flipgrid. So these are two examples of what I have done using Nearpod with the Collaborate Board. Um, again, low stakes, um, students cannot see who wrote what's on the Collaborate Board, only I can. Um, so I'm able to assess who is actually participating um, with this assignment. Um, but they don't know who is actually writing whatever's on there. So um, same thing with Flipgrid, depending on what kind of um, things you put on there, whether active or hidden or you have to accept. I think it's just a great way to have students um, responding to things in the target language, responding to something that you put out there um, or to each other. It could also work with videos. If they watch a short video in the target language, it's a great way to collect um, information. Uh, Interesting enough, I gave my first Flipgrid um, assignment the other day, and I was, this is the first time that I've seen my students, like, actual faces, so it was a great way to actually get to know them on a different level, um, which is what do they look like, what do they actually sound like, not with a mask on. Um, so again, low stakes, um, but this could be something that could be either an assignment, a short task, or it could be something that be, can be created into a project, and you'll see one of the, the examples of that in a minute. Um, so I'm actually at a project-based school. So these are some examples of ways that I've instituted um, formative assessment and technology for projects, benchmarks, and presentations. Two of the resources that I use quite frequently are Canva and Vocaroo. So Vocaroo is essentially an online tool. It is free. Um, students can use it on their computer or on their phone, uh, and it's easy for them to record themselves. Um, students can be in a comfortable setting, they can prepare their answers, uh, and redo the recording as many times as they need to. Uh, it also doesn't expire, so I still have Vocaroos from last year that are still accessible. Um, Vocaroo also provides several ways to save and submit their recordings. So whether it's a QR code, a link, or a downloaded file. It's a resource to get, that can be used inside the classroom as well as outside the classroom. And it's easy to navigate and use. Uh, this resource can provide a way for students to capture their interpretive um, and in presentational modes in one task. This is an example of how I infuse Canva, so in a Canva infographic, along with a QR code that came from Vocaroo. Uh, this is a great way for my students to show their understanding and present information in a more techy way. So they can infuse sentences, pictures, as well as the QR code. Uh, Canva is also an online resource and it can be used in several ways. Uh, this way is called an infographic and it is also easy to navigate, which is great for students and teachers. It is free, they just have to log in and it just, you can essentially give them a expectation, a rubric, and what you would want them to include on an infographic, as well as what they would be saying using the QR code. So whether it's in the target language or it's an explanation of the concept. Uh, another way is you can actually uh, use a gallery walk and use QR codes for the gallery walk. Um, you can build a lesson. So this particular lesson was a scaffolding lesson where um, we, I provided students time to collaborate in groups, build their understanding uh, using a resource like a poem, and they use their time to delve into the deeper meaning and diverse perspectives of what this particular poem was speaking on. Uh, it, poetry is always a great thing because there's not just one answer unless you know the poet and know what they were talking about. Um, but students were able to, uh, I, students are encouraged, right, to create poems when they feel connected to it. Uh, I ask them to reflect, to give a personal perspective, triumph, journey, or a struggle that they face in their lives. Uh, in the past, the students have used this project to share their cultural, religious, and identity journeys. Uh, being able to see from the eyes of a student is empowering, uplifting, and educational. 
Uh, as you can see, it's the Spanish and English version of this particular poem. And then on the right and left of it are their versions. They worked in small groups. And what I can do is I would put the paper up so everyone can read it. You could also have them recite it using a QR code and then post a QR code around the class. There are free materials online they can use to build up a student, student's comprehension and continue to develop a lesson. So this particular resource is Practical Spanish website. These are all basic beginner reading comprehension that allows students to listen to a short audio in Spanish. It's only Spanish, it doesn't have any other languages. Um, there are questions that are already created on the website. They can have time to comprehend and then create their responses. And lastly, in their own comfortable and safe space, can create their audio responses using Vocaroo. The output is based on the answers to the questions from this particular dialogue. Students can upload their audio responses using a link or a QR code in, other, in whatever for, portal you have for your school. Uh, scavenger hunts. So the rules of the scavenger hunt, whether virtual or in person are quite simple. Students must find all items and snap a photo. Once the timer ends, whoever has the most pictures wins. The basic idea behind a world language scavenger hunt is to allow students the opportunity to not only take pictures, but to create sentences. So in this particular example, um, what I was trying to have the students do is to work on the verb start and prepositions. Uh, another way you can do it is to, for them to figure out the item based on clues in the target language. Uh, so for instance, it was a, the place where this item would be located, a description of it using adjectives, and then lastly, what we, what we need it for. So students would have to read it, figure it out based in the target language, and then find the item in their home. And then write the word in Spanish on the right. One of the things that I love is it also provides an opportunity for students to be creative with their particular pictures when possible. Uh, this quick game uh, allows students to be creative to show understanding through writing and pictures within a time limit, not too long and not too short. And as you can see in these pictures, my students were trying to get extra creative points um, by <laughs> creating situations for their pictures to show that they were trying to think outside the box. Uh, in terms of how I've used Nearpod, um, again, there is a free version of Nearpod, but there's also a paid version of it. Um, students can build up a story together based on a lesson and online resource. So there are ways in which we infuse vocabulary. So one of the things that I love about vocabulary is that you can use words for different units, uh, but to have students create a word bank on paper and pen and a notebook is a little antiquated and they lose it all the time. So this is a great way for them to have it digitally. This was a slide that I created for them so they can either take a screenshot or I can share them into the slides and they can build up their vocabulary that way. For this particular, um, the vocabulary from the previous slide, was infused into this small group Spanish story. Uh, it was based around the animated film um, Hair Love, Amor de Cabello, and literally it was an amazing opportunity for students to work together and create their own version of the story in the target language. And the way that they shared it was using Nearpod. So again, for the Collaborate board, you had previously seen them write things and upload it. Here, this was a quick and easy way for me to get the QR codes to the uh, story, it was like storyboards uh, with pictures in the target language. There were no words in this. This was actually all, it was a, an audio book essentially. So these are still active. So if you actually scan them, you can read, you can actually hear the story come to life with the pictures. Uh, at the bottom left is my Latinx speaker. And then to the right is my motivated speaker. Okay, so when we're thinking about formative assessment, we often ask ourselves the questions, how do we know that they know? Um, and as we create our activities that we're going to do in class, um, we need to think about how we're going to adjust our instructional practices to support student achievement. That's ultimately the goal. Um, when formative assessment takes place within a lesson, how are we adjusting our instruction throughout the, throughout the lesson and also from day to day. 
And we have to think about how we're using active learning. How are they actively participating in class? Are we using um, a diverse um, series of tasks to make sure that we're targeting different learning styles and um, the three modes of communication based on the relationships we have with our students? Are we using that knowledge to create topics of discussion um, that are student-centered? And you know, whatever we're asking our students to do, whatever we're asking them to produce, did we provide adequate scaffolding so that they can be successful with the task? So when we're setting learning goals and measuring progress, um, we have to do this multiple times throughout our lesson, um, multiple times throughout a unit of study. And hopefully that will give us the information we need to adjust our instruction so that our students can be successful. All right. So we wanted to give time, that was a lot of information. So we wanted to give time um, for any questions that you guys may have, or if you guys want us to provide additional information on any of the resources that were shared today. So I'll ask a question and maybe some of the other attendees might wanna um, ask a question or put it in the chat. I was wondering when you showed the, the color-coded rubric, uh, the, the red, yellow, green, uh, the question always is with these rubrics, how does that turn into a grade in your grade book? So I'm wondering if you can uh, talk about that. Yeah, let me go back. Um, so depending on, you're talking about this one, right, Mike? Yes. Yeah, so interesting. So my school is based on expectations. So if I were really to hold to the expectations of our school, exceeding expectations would be a 95, meeting expectations would be an 85, and approaching would be a 75. Um, you can honestly, mathematically, depending on the assignments, you can create lower stake numbers. If this is going to be an activity in which, so for instance, um, I do interpersonal speaking with the students, whether in small groups or one-on-one -on -one outside in the hallway. Given that, that might be a, a smaller amount of points because I'm going to do it multiple times over. If this is a project grade, then it would be higher stakes. So depending on where they fall, it's going to kind of round up. I always round up because I never want to round down. I want to give them as much credit as possible, but it, it depends on the assignment. When you said for the exceeding expectations of 95, does that mean 95 or like 90 to 100. It, so yeah, so um, honestly, we we used to be on a, on a five scale at our school, and we now changed it. And so uh, it really wasn't to get a hundred percent or anything like 96 to 100. I think is that means that everything has to be perfect. Um, but we really were on a 90, like on a 95, 85, 75 scale. Now I'm doing zeros and fives. So I actually, so if, for instance, they were to fall in a meeting expectations in one bracket, but then in exceeding expectations in another, I would give them the half part. So it'd be 85 and 95, which would give them a 90. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then I would highlight what they would need to work on to bump that lower category to exceeding expectations. And Mike, recently I went to a training on assessment and um, the presenter shared like a, a similar concept that across the board exceeding expectations is a 95 um, meeting is 85. Like you have static numbers um, that may vary depending on the assignment but it is uniform for everyone because I think we can all think back to a conversation we've had with a student who nitpicked about the numbers. Um, and I think if we get into taking away one point for this, one point for that, it's hard to justify our grades across the board with all students. Um, so I think simplifying grades um, is helpful in many ways. Yeah, I agree. We, we started implementing a scale similar to this and some of the, the challenge with the students and the families is 
you know, isn't meeting expectations 100 because I did everything that you told me to do. So that's a whole cultural education system shift of what that, uh, of what that means. Mm -hmm. Right. We, we're in the process in different schools and different districts, different states um, about changing the mindset about grading and some content, um, like whether it's world language or science or ELA, we're all making different kinds of progress towards the shift. Um, and parents and kids are catching up, you know. And, and going back to like the idea of formative assessment though, realistically, that would be no grade, right? I could easily just have them say like, you're in the red zone, yellow zone or green zone. And if that's not graded because it's a formative assessment, once we get to the summative piece of it where they're gonna get a grade for it, they should already know where they lie and wh what they need to do to push forward when the grade does come. Any other questions? There is a question in the chat from Laura. Um, are we able to get a copy of your presentation? Yes, you will. <laughs> so I have to uh, put it in the shared folder, right, Mike? That's what we're doing, the shared folder for participants. Yeah, there was a, a form to upload it to. And then I believe when the recordings go out, any shared documents will go out with it as well. Perfect. Perfect. And once you get honest, all the QR codes are active. So those are actually my, my students. So I hope that you enjoy hearing them speak in Spanish. Any other questions? If you can't tell, we love QR codes. So on the screen you see right now, there's a QR code that will take you to our website um, where we have upcoming events. I believe there are two different events we have coming up um, in this winter section, like ending in December, but we will have other things coming up in the spring. They just aren't posted yet. So if you'd like uh, to chat with myself and Melissa in the future, um, be sure to scan that QR code. There's also a tiny URL on the screen that will take you to our website for more information about the work Melissa and I do with the Health and Welfare Fund of the Philadelphia Federation of Teachers. And there are also a plethora of resources that we've created, including steppers. So if there are any resources or websites that we um, stated during this session that you guys were like, I never heard of this, we actually have created steppers to give you a you know step-by-step -step walkthrough of how to get to it and how to engage with it. All right, well, thank you guys so much. We appreciate you taking a, a Saturday midday noon <laughs> to be with us <laughs> and have a wonderful rest of your day. So, <clears throat> excuse me, on behalf of PSMLA, we wanna thank everyone for attending um, this very helpful session with Melissa Moran and Sheree Graham. We welcome and encourage your feedback on our sessions. Please use the link in the PDF program or found in the chat to give this session feedback. The recording of this session will be available to conference <laughs> registrants after the event. As a reminder for teachers in Pennsylvania, in order to qualify for Act 48 credits, you must complete the Act 48 reflection form. And you can find this form in the PDF program or also in the chat. Please um, complete these forms within 24 hours of this session. Excuse me, thank you and enjoy the rest of our virtual conference. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Thank you.